2008's favorite bromance has signs of a little trouble in paradise? Former President Barack Obama recently warned President Joe Biden about GOP rival Donald Trump and his strategies, including having an iron grip on a loyal base. This according to a new report in The Washington Post. In a private lunch at the White House that took place in June, Obama also vowed that he would do everything in his power to help Biden's reelection effort. Here to discuss further is Michael LaRosa, former press secretary for First Lady Jill Biden. Welcome, Michael. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being with us. Yeah, so, you know, if, fill us in on you know, what the state of the Obama-Biden relationship is now, to the best of your knowledge. Well, it sounds pretty good. He was over at the residence for lunch a couple weeks ago, and I think they were having, you know, a pretty candid conversation and a pretty pragmatic conversation about the next election. And I think it's important that uh, what Pre President Obama said to President Biden, that all Democrats here, that you can't take this guy um, lightly. He has a loyal base, a loyal following, a cult-like following who will show up and show up in big numbers. And um, we have to work on doing the same with our folks and energizing our folks. So I, I think it's important that Democrats hear that message right away and that we don't take anything for granted. I mean, I think that's right. I, so much of the pushback, especially from the far left, further left uh, section of the broad <laughs> left, is that there's been a lot of blaming of voters who don't seem to appreciate that Biden has actually done a good job. Mm -hmm. We hear Bidenomics and the response is, well, why don't these why don't these disgruntled leftists, why don't the disgruntled liberals or independents who are saying they're going to stay home or choose one of these other candidates, mm -hmm. why don't they understand that Biden has actually been good for the economy? And the pushback has been, okay, well, there have been longstanding issues. Uh, a failure for wages to keep up with inflation. People are struggling in various different kinds of ways that are separate and apart from what anybody does in a four-year term. And so what how, what is Biden going to do to actually convince people that there's going to be real material changes in the next cycle and that it's not just another kind of vote blue no matter who, you got to come out for us because D Donald Trump is an existential threat sort of a pitch? Wow, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I don't know if there's going to be much of a, you're going to see much of a change in, in direction or tone. I feel like the White House was pretty empowered after the, the midterms, which had historic turnout, but also um, the overperformance uh, for Democrats was historic for a presidential uh, midterm for, in their own party. And so they feel pretty validated about accomplishing substantive things that Democrats have been trying to do for decades that were not done, like student loans, like cli climate legislation. But, but, but on the student loan point, I would argue yeah. there's a lot more but he's trying animosity to deliver. as a— uh, well. He's trying to deliver. And, and, and the bottom line is, it's early. Democrats will start being juiced up when they have a foil to run against, when they know it's a rematch, when they know who the alternative. It's ultimately a decision um, and a choice between two different people. And Democrats have to decide, you know, what choice they're going to make. Well, Mike, Michael, you just opened up a whole can of worms. Let's, because <laughs> yeah. first of all, many people are frustrated that even though this is, in fact, primary season, there is already this presumption uh, that Joe Biden is the only candidate, that there don't need to be any debates. The media largely isn't acknowledging the existence of certainly Mar Marianne Williamson. R.K. Jr., because of his polling numbers, has kind of forced himself onto the, the national stage, and he is recognized by the press, but only in a very dismissive, uh, derisive sort of a manner. Yeah. So one, the idea that there's just two choices is already something that people are frustrated by and skeptical about, especially since huge percentages, majorities of Democratic voters even, and overwhelming majorities of all Americans, don't want to see this Trump-Biden matchup mm -hmm. again. That may not have a choice. <laughs> so, then, so then what is your pitch? Because you brought up student debt, but obviously well, that student debt policy let's, let's was thwarted let's, by the court. Let's talk about like where we are at this point. Sure. Okay? We are at a point where uh, in 1992, uh, that incumbent president was being challenged. Mm -hmm. uh, 1995, the governor, the sitting governor of Pennsylvania, Robert P. Casey, was challenging President Clinton. People have, uh, people forget these things. Mm -hmm. And in 2011, Harry Reid had reportedly had to talk Bernie Sanders off the ledge from mm -hmm. primarying President Obama. We are at a very normal stage where, uh, you know, 
candidates are popular, governing isn't always popular. Governing, governing is harder and it's more divisive. Like Mario Cuomo said, you campaign in poetry, you govern in prose. Uh, there's a, right now, people are venting, a small pocket of people, are vent, of, of Democrats are venting their frustration that there isn't an alternative. But look, there usually isn't. He's the leader of the party. He's going to be the can. He's going to be the nominee, um, and he's ultimately going to face, uh, like any other incumbent, um, no other incumbent would uh, engage in a debate with a with a weak challenger or a nominal challenger. Maybe not. Trump is also not engaging in a debate, but the RNC is still holding debates, and the other candidates do have an opportunity to bring their case. To the they American don't have public. an incumbent. And President Trump, at this point in his cycle, was being primaried, I believe, by two ex-governors and one ex-congressman, much more serious candidates than President Biden has, and he didn't do any debates. No, you can say well, serious or not serious, but the last polls show that they had a combined 30 percent of the uh, votes. Now RFK Jr. has come down to 13 percent, Marianne's at 10 percent. Both are polling higher than every single person in the Republican field against Donald Trump, except for Ron DeSantis, and now in the most recent poll, Vivek Ramaswamy Look, is up. I agree that both Trump and Biden are extremely overwhelmingly likely to be the respective, you know, nominees of their parties, and we are headed for a rematch. Something wild well, we could know. happen, I mean, but it's pretty likely. I, um, I, I, Trump's popularity with the Republican Party, his his him being the focal point, is if anything getting stronger in the wake of all these indictments and everything. Are, are, do you have any concern that Democrats are almost sitting? Two are, are two um, like they think. Oh, this is great! It'll be Trump again. We beat him once. We can do it again. When, but but then when we see poll number, you know, forty three, forty three, right? We talked about yes. that yesterday. Mm -hmm. It's still it's so close. The last election was close. Mm -hmm. um, is, is there? It seems sometimes to me that Democrats want to be running. You know, they 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 just. Describe Trump as this existential threat to democracy, but they want to be running against him because they Hillary Clinton despise him. That, yeah, she she him. wanted that, uh, mm -hmm. and, and like, are we doing that again? Well, the difference is now we have, uh, I think, he earned goodwill in 2016 because he didn't have a record. For the last three elections, what we know, let's just go with what we know. Mm -hmm. What we know is that in the last three election cycles, Independents have fled from the Republican Party for Democrats because they are running scared from this guy. They do not. They do not support President. Or they do not support Trump when it comes to the ballot box. At least in 2018, in 2020, and in 2022. So it's been a referendum on him three times. So now we're going for a fourth time. And it has been close. So that was the point of President Obama's message. We can't take anything for granted. The country is still divided. The, com the country is still tribal. Um, it was the seventh close election in history. Not, not terribly close. The president did win by six million votes. Uh, right. President Trump did not did lose to Hillary Clinton by three million votes. Um, right. I mean, he, and he could get even more votes next time. Yes. But it's it's not yes. the votes overall so, that matters, right? right. It's the voters in but Pennsylvania and Michigan correct. and Arizona correct. and Georgia. But it's not his legal issues that uh, Democrats are. I mean, his legal issues have proven he uh, irrelevant. Like his his following and his supporters will be with. Him no matter what he does. So the noise out there with his, his legal issues really, I, I, I don't even consider when, you, when you're talking about electoral politics, um, because really it's about what independents think, what independents care about. And all we can go on is what we know. That's why anybody else but Trump is pretty But are famous. you worried about a voter who says to themselves, who you know, voted, maybe voted for Trump the first time, then, di then voted mm -hmm. for Joe Biden yeah. in 2020 because the COVID? antics of Trump during COVID yeah. were just beyond the pale yeah. and you were sick of this guy. Mm -hmm. And now you've had four years and maybe you're worried about the do. economy fundamentals. Mm -hmm. Trump's a little bit back of your mind now. You go, was it, you know, a lot a lot of people, even who don't like so much about Trump's behavior, liked the economy and 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 the the stability of the, the economic policies. Mm -hmm. Do you worry that they'll they'll pine for that and overlook, you know, the the craziness that was so front and center when they voted for Joe Biden uh, in 2020? I think I think, there, I think it's possible. I don't know if it's enough to overcome the look. The pres President Biden had a 37, 38 percent approval rating going into the last midterm cycle. We had a 40 year high record high inflation. Yeah. And voters really voters did not punish President Biden or his party. Yeah, I, I appreciate and that. So, they did much better well, than I expected. And, and you also had the Dobbs decision. Yes, and exactly. And exit polls showed you that 
it w was was it a referendum on the Democratic Party mm -hmm. and the support of the Democratic Party and Biden's uh, presidency, mm -hmm. or was it a referendum on the fact that people just wanted to maintain the right to choose and were angry at Republicans? And, yeah. and if it's the latter, how do you maintain that going into an election year two years later when people's memories are short and when, frankly, there's also a lot of frustration that during the Obama administration, Despite running on a promise to codify Roe, he declined to do so, mm -hmm. in some people's cynical view, precisely so that the Democratic Party can continue to use it as a bully pulpit to get people to the polls. Mm -hmm. Well, look, we have to keep reminding them. I mean, that's what happened last cycle, right? Everybody thought it was going to be a referendum on the economy and on the 40-year 40, 40 high inflation, and it wasn't. It was about people don't like their, their rights taken away. And we have to keep Democrats—it's going to be their job, the campaign's job, to remind those people in Pennsylvania, those, you know, especially the suburban women who are swing voters in Pennsylvania, Michigan, Ohio, um, Arizona, Georgia, uh, and Wisconsin— uh, uh, to remind them that, that Republicans want to take away your rights and Democrats do not. 44 million Americans stood to benefit from student debt cancellation. Now they're facing the prospect of having their loans turned back on at the beginning of next month, uh, in, you know, in less, in less than a month. Um, they benefited from Donald Trump having uh, imposed a student debt moratorium for the last three years, and it's going to be Joe Biden who's responsible for turning it back on. What do you make of that? The moratorium was put in place during during COVID. During COVID, yes. right, okay. While Donald Trump was president. That's yes, correct. And so now we've, President Biden has helped rescue the economy, bring back the jobs uh, back to pre-pandemic levels. So we're starting to um, reassimilate back to life uh, pre-COVID, at least. Um, and student loans are a part of that. Now, that was part of why he wanted to do legislation, the Supreme Court uh, interceded. So why agree to turn, uh, in the context of the debt standoff, the debt ceiling standoff, the one significant concession that Joe Biden gave to the GOP was to it, uh, commit to ending the student debt moratorium? Why? How does he, how does he look is, those 44 million is, Americans in the face? This is exactly why governing is never popular, but rhetoric usually is when you're running, when you're running on uh, a campaign. Uh, for the first time. Look, governing is hard, harder because it involves compromising. People don't like that. It's not, there's no instant gratification in that, right? Well, long term, there is. Long term, he's hoping to get his legislation passed. I think a lot of Americans are going to be asking the question why the people who are too poor to afford to go to college are the ones that had their financial futures uh, the basis of the, the grand compromise and not any number of other people with a lot uh, more significant monetary interest in the country. there are other voters who think they should just pay back the debt the loans that, that they, they took out. That they if you're taking to out take, loans, I, they are loans for a reason, right? <laughs> right. Well, I see a, a lot of agreement between someone is the Democratic Party and someone is in the Libertarian Party, and I think that there's a lot of working class and poor people who have a different kinds of populist interests. There are a lot of working being, class people who paid back their are, debts that are and being, would be resentful that they made different choices make the than audience, people. Make the argument to the audience. Uh, yeah. You don't have to make it to me, and the polls are behind me, and 44 million Americans are the ones who need to be convinced that they're lazy bums that should have paid back their loans. Is that the pitch that's going to get them to go vote for Joe Biden? I'm not sure that's the case. No, but what I will say is this, that elections come down uh, to a choice between two people. Uh, just really quickly, anecdotally, there's uh, somebody I met recently uh, who is lifelong, third-generation law enforcement. His whole family comes from a family of police officers and firefighters, and his dad was uh, on his way to go vote for um, Trump, and this, this man was going to vote for Joe Biden. And the father didn't understand why. And because this guy said, who do you want your, your, two, so your two grandsons um, to look up to? Who do you want them to be a role model? Who do, who do you want to be their role model, Donald Trump or Joe Biden? Um, and ultimately, voting, like we talked about before the election, it doesn't always come down to uh, economics. It comes down to how you relate to a person's values and how you relate to the the other people, the people on the ballot that you have to vote for, because it's a personal choice and it's a choice between two people, and I think that choice is going to be pretty uh, easy to make. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Of course, it's worth noting we are in a primary, and there are three Democrats running in the primary, and of course, Cornell West is also running as a Green Party candidate. We'll see if there's any other people that will announce uh, third-party campaigns as well. Thank you so much for joining us, Michael. You're welcome. Anytime. We're rising right after this.